All right, good afternoon. Welcome back to Wook Capital Management's weekly Wook and Review broadcast. I'm Managing Director Rod Altman. I'm joined by my social media manager, Joe Fonicello, and we're going to be presenting our uh, weekly roundup of major market news and impacts to stocks on our Wookie watch list. Uh, once we get through the, as we go through each kind of prepared item, we'll um, happily field any discussion or questions on each one before we move along. It's Good Friday today, April 7th, 2023. I think it'll be a pretty brief presentation today, uh, given the holiday and that markets were closed today. Um, before I get into the content, though, I'll just need to get a disclaimer out of the way. So I want everyone to be aware that Wook Capital Management Inc. and its employees solely provide investment advisory services to family clients and do not provide investment advisory services to the general public. Furthermore, investments are highly speculative in nature and involve substantial risk of loss. We encourage investors to obtain advice from a professional investment advisor and to make independent investigations before acting on information that we publish. We cannot assure you that the information is accurate or complete. We do not in any way warrant or guarantee the success of any action you take in reliance on our statements or recommendations. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results, and all investment decisions of an individual remain the specific responsibility of that individual. So with that out of the way, it was a, obviously a short week in financial markets, four days for equity markets. Bond markets were open today. Um, we got some significant amount of... Uh, economic data. So if you are watching this replay or following along in the Wook Discord, I'm sharing my screen and you can see our newsletter, the Wook in Review. So we had some um, updated data this week regarding the job market. For one, we received some updates on the Labor Department's adjustment factors for initial and ongoing jobless claims. So the revisions had to do with some seasonality, uh, which has obviously been very noisy amid the pandemic. And the revisions basically show that uh, the job market appears to be a little bit looser than uh, might have been understood from the unadjusted um, data. So claims have been higher to date in 2023 than previously thought. Um, claims are still low all else equal. So it's not that the job market is falling to pieces, but um, it's it's trending negatively. I think we can agree. We did get the some, some as come out at the beginning of every month, we got purchasing manager index data. So both the manufacturing and service PMIs were weaker than, uh, than a, a, a con really weaker than expected. So the manufacturing PMI came in, at four, the composite came in at 46.3. The way that the manufacturing PMI works is anything under 50 is contracting, anything above 50 is expanding. So most measures, almost all the measures really are contracting. So the composite's contracting at a faster rate than it was in February for the March reading. Uh, the new order index, which is viewed as a leading indicator is contracted further in March. It's now 44.3 down from the 47 in February. Production also below 50 prices, which is important. So for manufacturing prices paid, the index came in below 50, which that was a blip in February where it rose 51.3. Uh, it's come back down now. It's at 49.2. So kind of good data if you are of the view that the economy needs to slow somewhat to get inflation under control. The jobs report out this morning um, showed 236,000 jobs were added, which was roughly in line with what was expected. And it's a continuation of good news for, for the Fed. The Average hourly earnings growth data came in as expected, which shows a continued trend back toward more normal levels, which um, Greg Ip at the Wall Street Journal notes that this increases the odds that inflation can return to close to 2% without the Fed having to push uh, unemployment up sharply, right? That would be the soft landing scenario. So it's good to see 
uh, that the data do not show kind of the outsized strength that were shown in uh, January and to a lesser extent in February. So the data is a little bit incomplete, as all data sets, of course, are, in that this survey closed on March 12th, I believe it was. So basically the effects of the banking crisis are not really captured in this latest non-farm payrolls report. So it remains to be seen, you know, there was a slight decrease in finance and insurance jobs, um, or at least since the start of 2023, there has been, but we'll have to see how much more of a deterioration there is in the April report, which we'll get, unfortunately, I believe after the next Fed decision. So the market pricing uh, for the Fed, if we kind of use the FedWatch tool, we can see that it did jump day over day. So yesterday it was about a coin flip for whether the Fed holds flat at the next May 3rd meeting or if it hikes 25 basis points. It's now two thirds priced uh, that there's a 25 basis point hike next month. There's obviously some more data that comes out in the month between now and then. Um, we'll see how that changes uh, in the coming weeks if the Fed does in fact pause, which I still think is the appropriate decision. So that's kind of what's going on in the you know, real economy um, in the data that came out this week from a financial markets perspective, I uh, included this graphical, I'll switch over to coin, coin and it's a little easier to see. Um, you can see that sector wise, there was definitely evidence of that shift away from um, economically sensitive sectors, the market, or at least the asset flows this week were in line with more defensive positioning. So you saw the worst performing sector on the week was the XLI, the industrials, which are viewed typically as more economically and cyclically sensitive. The uh, healthcare index was the strongest performer on the week, followed shortly, uh, closely behind by the utilities. Healthcare and utilities are both fairly uh, viewed as pretty economically um, insensitive, right? Demand for healthcare and for, uh, you know, water and electric, et cetera, don't really fall off in a recession. So those were the strongest performers. We just kind of saw that rotation going on. There was also the noise of that you know, rate sensitive sectors like uh, communications and technology kind of um, have continued to perform well year to date. So uh, energy, of course, had a great week on the back of the surprise cut from OPEC. So while it started the week up almost 6%, it did close the week up 33 from last um the open that last Friday. So we, of course, markets weren't open today. We'll see how they trade next week. But uh, that's kind of what's going on um, in, in the macro and in markets. Um, I'm going to go through, since uh, there's only a few folks tuned in for now, I'm going to just keep going through the prepared content, and then we can kind of open it up maybe toward the end instead today. Um, just from programming notes, uh, we we made mention of this, uh, I think it was last week, but just to recap, we have the 2023 balance of year book, book list available. Uh, we sent that out in today's newsletter. Uh, we're going to cover The Big Short, which is a book that the movie was made after. Uh, Michael Lewis was the writer. Um, the famed book, of course, uh, a movie, of course, uh, is probably more well-known by most. I've never read the book. I've only seen the movie one time. So I'm looking forward to reading The Big Short. And we think it's pretty timely given the uh, banking crisis that just happened and is, I guess you could argue, ongoing in some sense. So that'll be our book for May 20, uh, sorry, April 25th, last Tuesday of every month at eight o'clock is the date and time that we meet up on, on uh, the, for the book club. So that'll be on Twitter spaces for the time being. Um, just, you know, I want to make note that uh, Elon Musk has um, decided to prevent even more kind of information sharing and is really shutting down the ability to share information on the Twitter platform. So we'll for now continue using the platform. Um, in lieu of superior alternatives presenting themselves, um, you know, we'll, we'll communicate any changes in advance if we do change away from Twitter as our kind of preferred live broadcast medium. But uh, yeah, he, he's 
doing everything in his power to prevent people from sharing their sub stacks and you know any any platforms he's afraid of effectively. Uh, it's, it's quite quite sad to see. But let me continue. Um, from a Wookiee watch list perspective, we had some big movers this week. So let me pull the watch list up. Um, I'll sort it by weekly price move. And we can see a couple huge red uh, moves. So we got Bed Bath, PLBY, Airbnb, all the double digit moves down over the last week. Tesla with a 5% move down. We're going to talk about Tesla, AMC, and in the prepared kind of material I have. Um, and, and, you know, really if, if people want to obviously chime in, you're, you're welcome to come up as a speaker, but okay. So I'll start with AMC because it was quite a, quite a wild week for AMC. And you know, we've talked about it a few times in the look and review and just to kind of recap, recall that the company ran up on a, on a limitation of how many shares of AMC common stock they could sell into public markets. They devised a scheme where they came up with these ape preferred equity units, which are effectively like the common stock in terms of voting rights and economic rights. Um, because the company could not sell more shares of common stock until they amended their um, bylaws, they continued to sell ape units. Now, uh, because of this uh, and because the retail audience that owns AMC common stock, the largely e retail audience that owns AMC common stock doesn't seem uh, to like the ape units. There's been this ongoing significant delta between the price of AMC and the price of ape. So um, there's been some arbitrageurs who've tried to you know, short AMC common stock, long ape. Um, and it looked like at the start of the week that things were going to move in that direction. Uh, you had um, on Monday night, this settlement that was reached, a proposed settlement that was reached between the uh, plaintiffs who'd filed a class action against AMC and the company. So that happened Monday evening and the price of APE went up meaningfully. The price of AMC went down on Monday. However, then well, late Wednesday night, the judge in the case basically said, uh, no, you guys can't just settle without me. Uh, we're going to go through the procedural safeguards for class action settlements and uh, you know, move forward in a way that does not resolve the matter immediately, right? So um, because of this, uh, the quirks of the very high cost to borrow for short sellers of AMC common stock, um, the AMC common stock went back up on Thursday and APE fell back down as we await um, what seems like a matter of time, frankly, where the two are combined again, the shareholder approval for um, you know, the, the shareholders voted yes to allow this to happen. Um, but, you know, this this court case is, is just holding things up. And the judge in uh, the Delaware Chancery Court judge who's overseeing the case basically um, was not going to let them just, uh, you know, wash their hands of it without going through the formal procedures to ensure, uh, you know, that all, even even those who didn't file the class action, those who are part of the class, uh, kind of have their their rights protected um, by the court. So, you know, just in a second thought, uh, because I saw it in the Wall Street Journal this week. Kind of, you see this graphic of domestic box office results. So, really, for the preceding decade, uh, box office receipts in the U.S. ranged from around ten and change billion to eleven and change billion dollars in domestic box office gross receipts. And of course, the pandemic really, really dragged that down with all the closures. So even even through 2022, though, uh, you only got to about seven and change billion in gross receipts. So you're still down 30 plus percent from pre-pandemic revenue levels, which is obviously an existential threat for the operating business. Uh, you know, whether whether the people that are buying the common stock know or or not, they're buying an operating business that underpins 
the equity and uh, that business is challenged, right? Um, there's been, a, they're not the only movie theater chain that's challenged. Um, National Cinemedia is on the brink of bankruptcy. Um, you, you, Cinemark from a equity value perspective is, has been beaten down meaningfully. So, you know, eventually these things do matter. Um, for now, they, they really haven't because the, a, the AMC apes don't really care, it seems, about the operating business very much. Um, but look, you know, the number of film releases is still down you know, 30 plus percent. So it's, uh, you know, will it ever return to pre-COVID levels? And even if it does, will that ever justify the valuation for, the, for these theater, theatrical and cin cinematic businesses? Um, it's tough to say. But yeah, look, AMC uh, still uh, a favorite. Um, the enterprise value is, is multiples higher than it was even in the peak of the business. So it just remains in very much a meme. And uh, you know, we'll see how this court process resolves itself. So I've so got two more before I'll kind of open it up to wherever folks want to go. Um, PLBY. Of course, everyone's favorite shit co uh, sold its Yandy.com uh, business for a pretty big loss, which um, I'm not sure that the market reacted actually in a, in a, in a rational way to it. Uh, so let's talk about that for a minute, right? The company came out in its last earnings call and made it clear that they're undergoing a meaningful restructuring. So what does that mean? They're going to cut jobs. They're going to sell off money losing assets. Yandy.com is a money losing asset. So I have the PLB uh, investor deck they put out at the last uh, earnings up on my screen. You can kind of see the breakout for the direct to consumer businesses. So Yandy.com in 2021 had almost $58 million in revenue. In 2022, it had a paltry 33.1 million. So a huge 40 plus percent reduction in revenue year over year. The company had talked about this and chalked a meaningful portion of it up to the changes in the iOS advertising rules. Um, this is a cheap costume and lingerie business. It's just a kind of a drop shipper for the most part, uh, .com. And getting uh, customer acquisition through those um, kind of targeted ads was their business. And when those ads, kind of the process changed, uh, the cost for customer acquisition went up meaningfully. Um, they, as operators, did a poor job of stocking up, leading up to kind of their peak uh, Halloween in both 21 and, and repeated itself in 22. So, so some things beyond their control, a lot within their control, poor operations across the board, they spent 12 plus million for the business in 2019 before COVID and before these changes, of course. But when you look at that 33 million in revenue for 22, if you look at page 25 of the investor uh, presentation, you can see that they do break out cost for Yandy. So, okay, cost of sales on an unadjusted basis for Yandy on that 33 million in revenue, 27 million. So, I mean, we're, we're talking about... Um, you know, a, a, a sub 20% gross margin. That's not a good business. Uh, it's pretty hard to cover your overhead costs and your selling costs when you're operating at a 19-ish percent gross margin. So uh, they had then, they, the company show in this pro forma, right, adjustment that there was 14.4 million in selling and administrative costs. So right there alone, you're talking about 33 million in revenue and 40 one and change million in direct and indirect costs for Yandy. So Yandy was losing high single digit millions of dollars for 2022. So in the context of the 8K they filed uh, last week where they announced the sale of the business, um, you know, I had put out an analysis in late 2022 where I had uh, estimated they could get $5 million for the business. They ended up getting $3 million for the business, which frankly is less consequential than the fact that they could have simply shut the business down and it would have been an improvement from the baseline, right? The baseline was running the business at, at an operating loss um, while they only got 
you know, less than a quarter of what they invested in the business in 2019 back out. Uh, I think that the more important thing is to consider it in the context of the restructuring. So they took meaningful cost out of the business by selling off this money loser, this non-core asset. Uh, and, you know, I think there's, there's fair frustration among the investor base, but I think it's in line with what they told investors are going to be doing. So that think that part of the reason for the sell-off in the stock this week, it closed at $1.64, 120 million market cap, about 300 million enterprise value, was that you know that they sold this business, people expected a sale, management had warned of the sale uh, in the earnings call, but maybe the sale came in below expectations and for some, you know, it was just a sign that they, uh, they were gonna capitulate. Um, it, it does feel that way, um, you know, that the, the kind of sentiment around the stock is awfully capitulative. Um, you know, we, we are doing work and we may publish some incremental research on it. So I don't want to go into too much detail, but all in all, I think disposing of a money losing business, getting something for it and getting it out of your hair is good. If your goal is to restructure around your core profitable licensing and, luxury lingerie owned brand uh honey Burdette, and of course the playboy brand so that's kind of my thinking on, on the yandy sale um, i'm a little surprised at at how the market reacted this week but but frankly uh you know so, sometimes hard to over emphasize too much on short-term price movements when you know that a lot of what is happening in the market is related to the broader factor right we talked about at the onset of this discussion how industrials were down this week because of the shift out of risk on cyclicals you know, discretionaries were down to playboy is of course a discretionary brand so um it's a high beta discretionary when bitcoin discretionary is down a couple percent it's going to be down more than that so it's, it's hard to i guess tease out too much information from the move uh, but regardless the the fact remains that the business trades at its lowest ever valuation and uh as we believe it at a very deep discount to the sum of the parts so I'll leave it at that for Yandy for now. Obviously, we can circle back after I get through Tesla, um, which is our last kind of prepared item that I had. We got several different pieces of data out of out from Tesla this week. Uh, we got the first quarter delivery figures, which were on the back of those very steep price cuts that they had undertaken earlier in the year. So they did deliver more vehicles than they did in the fourth quarter of 22. They delivered about 423,000 vehicles. So that's up 4% quarter over quarter. And it is up 36% year over year. However, the, that's got to be considered in the context of the CEO guiding for them achieving uh, you know, 52% growth in 2023 versus 2022, as well as that rate being sustained for years in terms of what's priced into the stock. So uh, while the price cuts clearly did a good job of reviving some of that demand, and, and obviously the sales results would have been worse had the cut price cuts not been effectuated, um, it is a worrisome sign, I think, because this negatively impacts Tesla's margins, which are industry leading, uh, or for mass market leading. Um, and really, uh, there's not much Tesla can do in the face of kind of interest rates having risen so meaningfully for car payments and these very large car payments. Uh, I saw data earlier this week that it's like north of teens percent of new loans today are north of $1,000 per month. So for the median income um, household or, or worker, it's just absolutely beyond reach, um, kind of the, that sort of a payment and that sort of a cost. So uh, they did cut prices again. News was out this morning that there was an incremental price cut across their entire product line. Um, so I had included a story from earlier this week kind of highlighting how they're very now long in the tooth Model S and Model X uh, saw their lowest deliveries in a year and a half in the first quarter, especially steep drop off um, for the X. And yeah, uh, we, you know, we these are these are high margin cars. Obviously, the three and the Y are the primary products that they're selling. You know, the S and X are not even ten percent uh, of deliveries in the quarter. 
Um, but those are obviously much higher margin than the S and the, uh, sorry, than the Y and the three. So fall off in their kind of premium vehicles, um, slashing prices again, uh, another price cut this morning that lowered the Model 3 and Model Y by 1,000 and 2,000 respectively. Um, you've got this kind of cliff coming too from the federal tax credit. The $7,500 tax credit is going to have requirements tighten uh, further in the coming week. So I think it's April 18th, that credit is going to be reduced by almost $4,000. It's going to get cut in half on the Model 3 rear wheel drive, for example. So um, there's a lot of headwinds, right? We talked about kind of the slowing economy broadly um, for Tesla as a highly valued, high growth stock um, in that context. It, it will be interesting to see how they perform through the balance of the year. And if investors kind of ignore uh, the big slowdown in growth that they're paying for at the current valuations. So Tesla did end up down 5% of the week. Most of that drop was Monday. Um, much of that drop was Monday after the week results came out. So, so yeah, that, that's kind of what's going on in, in some of the stocks we've been following. Um, you know, I didn't mention Bed Bath & Beyond this week because I think that story is just about wrapped up. Uh, unfortunately, the common stock fell almost 50% this past week. We, we mentioned it last Friday that they had, um, you know, it, it was real desperate times. They're basically selling every share they can uh, using their new at-the-market offering as fast as they possibly can to try and stave off what will otherwise be a bankruptcy filing likely later this month from what they've disclosed. Um, it doesn't look like it's going too well. Uh, you know, with the stock continuing to fall so rapidly, the amount that they raise from each incremental sale, of course, falls. And, you know, while something's better than nothing, uh, it does strike me as an insurmountable challenge. And I think Bed Bath Beyond's bankruptcy is imminent, um, which will be nice because we can take it off the list and not talk about it anymore. <laughs> so, all right. That's uh, I think that's the wrap then for our prepared content. Uh, I see you know, a few folks in the room who often chime in. Um, it's only 4.30. So like I said, I thought it would be a pretty quick presentation this Good Friday. Um, happy to talk more about any of the companies or the macro economy that we kind of discussed today or, or any other topics, really, if anyone in the audience wants to kind of branch out. And yeah, we'll keep the conversation going until, um, until people, you know, no longer have anything to say. So. Joe, what else? Is there anything that you have seen this week that uh, that we didn't discuss that, that we should talk about a little bit? Yeah, it's a pretty short week, and it's going to be a short week next week too. So, I mean, hopefully everyone can uh, distract themselves from the, market, from the market for the weekend. You know, enjoy Easter with your family if you celebrate it. And um, not too much of a box for, for the next few days. Are you out at lunch or something? <laughs> yeah, it's a little loud here. It's a taco place. <laughs> okay. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, it was a, like it was actually, there was a lot that went on in terms of economic data, but, but in terms of the world coming to an end, yeah, there weren't, there weren't really any more crisis related uh, stories this week, right? We, we've kind of gotten the imminent banking crisis in the rear view mirror. Um, you know, what the longer term effects of the slowdown in credit creation and the economy mean. I mean, you know, we talked about this in past weeks, all else equal, the economy should slow further, faster net of what happened in with the bank crisis. Um, you know, the Fed is going to want to see more data, right? The jobs report out this morning, as I mentioned, is not really inclusive of the crisis. So, um, you know, I'm, even though the market's pricing more, you know, one more increase now, a little more likely than not, I still think that pause is the prudent action given the vast majority of the data show that you know, wages are returning toward normal trend. We don't seem to have a wage price spiral. Consumer expectations of inflation have been plummeting. We don't have a dis, you know, a misalignment between what consumers expect um, and what the Fed wants. Like there's a lot you can point to, I think, if you're in the soft landing camp. Or, or of the view that the economy doesn't need to crash for the Fed to get inflation under control. Um, and I think that 
again, as we talked about, the, the lagging outputs of like CPI and PCE, when you look at the leading inputs, almost everything looks pretty favorable. But um, what's up, Chris? Happy Friday. Happy Friday, Rod. What do you got? Um, yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I don't really have a whole lot to say about um, what's what's happened this week. I just thought the the whole situation with AMC is really interesting, especially given the the Chancery Courts, the uh, the Chancery Court of Delaware, their opinion and um, legal implications for what's what's going on with this ape and AMC stock split. Like, I, I don't know if that was even legal, if, if, if maybe they'll be prosecuted for, you know, what they did without a shareholder vote. Yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't know the minutia and I'm not a legal expert. I'm obviously not a lawyer, so I don't know what the answer to that is. But right, you, you it's kind of weird. I mean, in one sense, you had a class action filed by the common stock holders, right? The AMC common stock holders who now want to settle. It seems like really the parties that brought the suit want to settle. The company wants to settle, but because it's a class action, the Delaware chancery judge is saying, uh, no, 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 no. There's other parties that are you know, part of this, even though they're not the ones who brought the class action, they're part of the class. So, in order to make sure it's fair to all of the class, the judge needs to, you know, the, the judge made a decision in line with that, with her decision not to you know, sign off on the proposed settlement, which would have been accelerated. So like, I, yeah, I don't know if there's liability for the company or its directors. I mean, I know you've traded the common stock at times, uh, you know, short and like tried to, you know, monetize it. You know, I, I, we in the past, what capital has traded it. We do not presently have positions in it, but um, I mean, it, it seems like it's just a matter of when, not if you get AMC and Ape reunited and Adam Aaron continues to sell equity to, you know, fund the business. Uh, and it's really just going to be similar to Bed Bath, just a longer, slower continuation of ongoing dilution to pay bondholders and, you know, the underlying business, as we kind of talked about, the, the underlying fundamentals for the cinematic business are not favorable. They don't look like they're going to get better. Um, but at, so long as equity is continuing to be willing to allow itself to uh, be diluted to hell, then... You know, I don't see what's wrong with that, right? They, you know, that's kind of like the whole bed bath playbook. I mean, I get, I get there's nuance and a little bit of difference between the two, right? But yeah, I mean, I think at this point it kind of sets a like a very big precedent. Like, why even file for bankruptcy if you can at first, you know, maybe try to, you know, put some, you know, stock offerings up in the market. And of course, they have these disclosures saying like our stock is volatile and there's, you know risk of short squeeze and stuff and then people read that and they interpret it the wrong way um yeah so, matt, i know matt levin is off and money stuff was off yeah. this past week but his his what he wrote up on thursday after this kind of last batch of news came out is basically what you just said right why file bankruptcy because because one of these three things will happen. I, I have it up on my screen. His uh, his most recent newsletter. It's like okay, if <clears throat> instead of just filing bankruptcy and your common stock goes from three to zero immediately, why not just complete the relevant disclosures, which you just kind of alluded to, and just keep selling stock forever for as long as you can? Um, maybe. Uh, you do raise enough to prevent it from you know going bankrupt. You sell off, you sell enough equity to pay down enough debt that maybe the operation improves and and hey we we did it. You know we don't have to sell any more stock. Bankruptcy threat's gone. Um, alternatively, right? Eventually you just keep selling stock and the price goes to zero anyway. Now you raised money. Uh, 
you, you, you can't pay back all your debts, but you made some and, you know, creditors are happy, right? All else equal, you'd think the creditors would prefer these weird outcomes, um, you know, where, where basically un, uh, you know, I don't want to be rude, but, like, you know, the rubes at the table just keep funding creditors, you know, by, by bringing their own chips to the table that go directly into creditors' pockets effectively once the bankruptcy is, is consummated. And these companies are in, they're in passive indexes as well, right? Like Bed Bath & Beyond is in a couple, I think. And I think AMC must be in some as well. And I'm wondering like if there's people putting money into indexes that are passive that own these stocks and um, as more money flows, these indices. So yeah, you're right. Um, for Bed Bath, using Coifin's current data, I don't know... I, I do not imagine there's a lag in the data, but it says that U.S. ETFs own a little less than 4% of Bed Bath & Beyond common stock. Um, you know, it's only 5.5 million, at least that's their calculation. I don't know which, you know, market cap denominator they're using, but there's 39 ETFs representing almost 18 million shares for Bed Bath. And for AMC, it's uh, it's a lot more. It's almost 300 million worth um you know, it's, it's actually like 11%, um, I guess, ownership is by ETF. So you're right. The world of passive indexing and these now peculiar long, slow death m dilution marches, it does, like, I guess, raise some curious questions. Yeah, it's kind of it's it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think I think Matt has also spoken in the past a lot about this whole idea of passive investing and um, how it's 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 kind of crazy, right? Because like you have this this company that's structurally bankrupt, but they just keep issuing shares and funds are probably still rebalancing and maybe they buy some, maybe they're selling it. I, I don't know exactly, you know, what, what's going on. But I mean, if, if it's still in the index, they haven't gotten kicked out, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But you're right. For all intents and purposes, Bed Bath & Beyond is, is already bankrupt. I mean, it's unfortunately not. And unfortunately, I, I, I glance over at the Reddit because I... I had joined it at one point, uh, you know, maybe a year ago, um, you know, when Ryan Cohen got involved. I know I've mentioned this in the past that we at Wook did conduct an analysis of Bed Bath & Beyond as a prospective investment in, in the first quarter of 22. Um, the determination was no, it's not looking like an attractive investment. Um, you know, I've mentioned in the past that we've successfully monetized some of these squeezes by writing calls on them and you know, we don't currently have any exposure to it though but um you know it's it's just really like it's it's like the worst side of crowdsourced research because you get a lot of people who have a you know, they're really hopeful for what they want to happen and they keep looking for information that kind of confirms their bias as opposed to you know, the, the capacity to just kind of step back and realize okay unfortunately this is a failed investment this is what's really going on. Um, they just kind of, a lot of them just keep digging deeper and deeper. And, you know, eventually in this case, it, it will file for bankruptcy. And, you know, as we've seen, right, there've been some bizarre stock movements based on bankruptcy filings. Revlon recently, um, you know, filed for bankruptcy and, and the equity was going to be worthless because of how much debt stood in front of equity. And then you got, again, a lot of these you know, newer market participants who don't, you know, care about anything fundamentals related they just kind of care about you know s squeezing the shorts i guess um that you know have big followings and unfortunately lure people into these traps and uh you know it's, it's just unfortunate i i feel badly because i yeah we're talking about it right and, and hopefully no one has uh come away with the view just because we're discussing these securities that they're interesting or attractive investments um you know it's more it's more an observation and uh an intriguing kind of it's like a car crash you can't look away but you, you kind of want to talk about what's actually happening here and yeah I, I know you were a mod at the bbby 
Discord or not Discord, uh, Reddit at one point, and you know, I, you probably know better than most how like off the tracks it's gone. Yeah, I mean, the kind of posts that we were getting even early on was kind of crazy, and um, I had to leave at one point. It was just it was just too much. Yeah, I just didn't want to really be on there anymore, and it was it was, it was kind of depressing, honestly, because when you know what's going on behind the company and these people when everything is staring them in the face and it's so clear what's going on with the company, they, they pick out some thing and they make, make up some stuff and yeah, it's just, I really don't want to talk about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. And it's frustrating. I see, you know, people taking, um, you know, clips of Keith Gill talking about, you know, his investment thesis for GameStop and, and somehow because Ryan Cohen bought it and sold it at some point in 20, uh, Two, right, that there's some secret scheme for his, um, you know, children's book uh, entity to, you know, do so. like it, it's just it's just bizarre. I don't, I don't. Yeah, I just that. shared a uh, tweet to the nest. <laughs> Involves me in the same kind of crazy conspiracies as uh, somebody sent a video clip of the interview I did with Cohen, where Cohen tweeted in reverse, and they're trying to relate that to a reverse merger of Bed Bath and Beyond. So yeah, these people are a little crazy. Yeah, I think that guy went to the CEO's office in New Jersey, and I think he has like a restraining order or something with the with the company. Ooh, Joe just uh, shared a, a live pic of his current view, where we've got a Playboy sweatshirt. <laughs> Live on the ground due diligence, Joe. Appreciate it. I'm telling you, I see Playboy merch every day. Well, unfortunately, the issue is that they are not uh, retail operators. Uh, ben Cohn, obviously, is, is a horrific business person. And regrettably, Suhail uh, is, is seemingly not willing to let his old, um, old partner get put out to pasture. Uh, you know, the core D to C business, right. Then just selling kind of branded apparel and accessories, et cetera, did lose money. And they're, uh, basically going to go in the direction of trying to find someone else to operate the business for them, whether in a joint venture capacity, um, something that I did get some good clarity from an investor who had a meeting with Ben and Stu Hale recently was, you know, part of the reason why that they're doing more of these joint ventures as opposed to pure licensing deals is that with creative artists, the global licensing manager, and they've got to pay 20% to them for all you know, licensing deals made under that agreement. Whereas if they structure something as a joint venture instead, uh, for example, the China joint venture with Fung Group that you know they've not shared much detail publicly about but my understanding from some of these discussions is that um, you know, Playboy is effectively going to let Fung Group manage all of their existing licensees in China, where they sell at, at the end, you know, check out. There's over a billion you know, and a half dollars in sales related to the Playboy brand in China. So it's a very different brand in China. The magazine was never a thing in China. The magazine hasn't been a thing for over three years now. Which, you know, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people still seem to think the people who haven't actually done any iota of work on what this enterprise is. So, like, China, you've got that. And then the question mark of what does that joint venture structure look like, which I've heard some detail. I'm not going to go over it in this venue right now. But, you know, they're just um, you're very poor communicators. They've been very poor operators. But when you actually look at what assets the enterprise owns it's, it's quite inconceivable to me that the enterprise value is below 300 million because I, I could actually make an argument that honey Burdette alone is worth um you know 60 70 80 percent of that and if you know that look there's going to be a sale a spin there's going to be something with honey Burdette, in my opinion before year end um you know if they get the right price i think they would sell it outright I know that they want a double digit multiple on EBITDA, which you know, so let's call it 25 million in EBITDA. That would imply they want to get 250 million for it, which I don't know that they will. They'd need, really need to find a, 
a very interested buyer. The other challenge is that they don't really have much negotiating leverage, right? They're currently a public kind of orphan, DSPAC, um, you know, consumer discretionary DSPAC. Like it, it checks all of the boxes for shit you want to stay far away from if you're a professional investor. It's too small for most to touch. The um, share price is too low for many to touch. So it kind of is at that point where there's no logical buyer. So even though you had Suhail Rizvi, who owns, you know, let's call it 29.99% beneficial ownership of the stock, who oversubscribed to the rights offering at $2.56. So now even, it's like he now has a standstill that he cannot go past 30%. So clearly he's indicated to the market that he sees, you know, the price worth more than 256, right? He's not putting tens of millions of dollars of capital to work with the, uh, for charity. Um, you know, my discussions with investors that have spoken to him, he kind of sees liquidation. Uh, it sounds like, right? Who knows what will pan out, but he kind of sees liquidation you know, between seven and, and ten dollars per share. So my concern is actually that the, as the stock trades at these extraordinarily depressed levels, you get even though he's under standstill, you may get a competing bid, or somebody's going to make a tender, and then he can kind of counter and. Uh, effectively you know take the whole thing private which does become a risk you know if you're looking for more than you know a quick buck um on the investment from current levels but no look it's um clearly i'm talking about it but i i look forward to hopefully painting a picture for uh for folks um of of kind of how i am and we are seeing it so hopefully more to come on that front in short order but yeah, I mean, Joe, to your to your observation, and from all of the kind of survey data that I've seen, the brand is actually pretty healthy in the eyes of Gen Z, and uh, you know, there's there's not it, it's it's kind of bizarre, right? You went from a brand that was like eighty plus percent older male as your end consumer when it was a you know a magazine, to now it's more like fifty fifty male female. And it's skewed way toward younger on average. So it's a very different business today than it was a few years ago. Um, there's been some horrific operational decisions made by current management. And it's understandable by some market participants have no interest in touching it. But uh, it, it just gives me a lot of GameStop-like vibes in that some people are so certain of a certain outcome when if you really kind of scratch beneath the surface, it's... Uh, I don't know. It's, um, I bought in my personal account 25,000 shares this week on Thursday and Wednesday. Uh, and it, it just is, is at that point where it's, it's just deeply irrational. It's not trading on any basis of, of underlying reality, in my view. Which it can do for a long time. And uh, if somebody makes a takeout offer you know, at $2 per share, RISV could always counter, and uh, you know if the board accepts that, um, you know, unfortunately that's that is a big risk. I view that as a primary risk here, uh, is is effectively a takeout at, at depressed valuations. Because let's be honest, bankruptcy is not a risk right now. Uh, the company's waived its debt covenants through June 2024. It has no minimum cash maintenance requirements until that time as well. So it doesn't matter that the current operation on a pro forma basis might still be losing money um, because you don't have a solvency issue, but it's trading like it has that. And yeah, we'll, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I've, I've spent a lot, probably as much time and brain power on this as any other stock uh, except GameStop. <laughs> and um, I'm just, you know, I, I'd like to, uncover what I'm missing. I don't know what I'm missing other than sentiment and, uh, you know, the market kind of pricing in what has happened as what will happen into the future. But I think it's ignoring the restructuring story. But yeah, um, it's 4.52 and we can talk about whatever. If anybody wants to come up, Ask any other questions. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we'll wrap up pretty soon here.
Are you going to go see the Nintendo movie? <laughs> the Mario movie? I'm mad because I got a free birthday ticket to go see it at C- CMX Cinemas, which the Cine Bistro in uh, Hyde Park in Tampa is not showing the movie. And it's like, I have this free oh, birthday pass I want to use, and I can't go see the movie. It's crazy that they're not going to show it there. Let me check. Maybe, maybe I looked too early. I do not attend the movies. Oh, no, they have it. Six o'clock and nine o'clock tonight. I won't be seeing it tonight, but uh, that might be something worth doing this weekend. I mean, I'm a huge fan. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm pretty beast at Mario Kart. I'm not going to lie. If you go up against me, I'll probably beat you. And, <laughs> and I've played the game since I was like old enough to play it on Super Nintendo. So <laughs> wow. I'm a big fan of that franchise. I look forward to seeing the movie. Yeah, the stock is trading at around 13 times trailing. We talked about it last time. Yeah, I think, what was it? We were talking about it on, um, I think, the open mic. Yeah. It's like yeah, a two-year low, yeah. almost. Here's a good example, right? Nintendo, there's, all, there's less ETF exposure to Nintendo than there is to an imminently bankrupt Bed Bath & Beyond by multiples. Less than 0.03% of Nintendo is owned by US ETFs. There's only three ETFs that own it. Um, and this goes back to you know, BTI, right? Similar to Nintendo. BTI, British American Tobacco, an almost $80 billion market cap company, has $45 million worth of uh, its market share held by ETFs, 0.06%. So, I mean, there's, there's definitely some truth to people who say stuff like the market, you know, is not, you know, you shouldn't use fundamentals as your sole driver. And I would agree, you shouldn't use fundamentals as your sole driver, but it should be the benchmark of your, like, it should be the foundation of your analysis, should be driven by fundamentals. And there's a lot of other analyses you can do, but like at the end of the day, in the long run, what drives the valuation of the business is the free cash flow it generates per share. And if your free cash flow per share is negative, and it's not going positive, it's not growing, then uh, your business isn't worth anything. Um, I wonder why they haven't, you know, listed in New York or why um, why ETFs don't buy it. Um, it's a big company. They're a big brand. Um, they have, I mean, especially if, like, you have an ETF that's that wants to invest in gaming, right? Like, besides Sony and Microsoft. And remember, Nintendo's a Japanese company that is not a um, not a great capital allocator, right? You've got a massive cash pile sitting there, and uh, they they the Japanese companies generally, uh, you know, don't carry leverage. They they carry you know a lot of cash, right, which kind of drags down your returns on capital. Um, Nintendo is at a negative 3.2, you know, net debt to EBITDA, right? A huge net cash mm-hmm. position for Nintendo. So there's, there's reasons why companies like Nintendo trade at, at discounts to some, you know, American based companies that are not just explained by the, you know, ETF ownership. Um, but I you know we were saying it the other day, like if it traded down another turn or so, you know, you could buy Nintendo for eight times, um, you know, EBIT. On an enterprise value perspective, I think that that's a pretty good buy, and I, I think that Nintendo is kind of in a, cl- a little bit of a class of its own with all the IP it has. Like, what other you know video game um, kind of company can go out and kind of publish uh, or produce a you know a blockbuster movie like this movie seems like it's shaping up to be? There's there's you can count them on one hand, and you know th- there's reasons why Nintendo is not attractive as an investment for sure. Um, it is still pretty cyclical in that it's based on, you know, well, if the next product coming after the Switch is another Wii U, well, uh, Nintendo could very easily trade down, you know, 50%. Mm-hmm. Um, but no, it's a business I'd love to own for the right price. Um, and, and frankly, it's the console I, of choice for me in my youth. So maybe there's some sentimentality there. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I think it's pretty impressive that in this industry that they've been able to consistently like carve out their niche in the market like uh, with sony and microsoft you know they're like the big ones and these guys kind of have a different 
segment. You know, there's a lot of casual gamers. I know some people that wouldn't typically buy a console. Um, they would probably never buy an Xbox or a, a PlayStation, but um, yeah, they have a Nintendo Switch and it's fun, you know, and they, they enjoy it. And in this day and age where you can play all these games on your phone, I think that's, that's honestly pretty impressive that um, they can do this. They can offer an experience that's, you know, better than arguably and than, than a, you know, the latest mobile device with all this com- compute power. Well, hopefully they'll release one with some real compute power and that comes yeah. in 4K because, <laughs> frankly, yeah. the, the switch is pretty long in the tooth at this point, but demand keeps holding up. Um, from yeah. Like, I think as we talked about it, I think there was reporting from Bloomberg in January, they were still expecting pretty great results and it still could end up being the best selling console of all time, depending how many more years they produce it. it it's already in rarefied air, but it's conceivable mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, again, who knows what happens um, and what's next to come from them, but one yeah. of the best-selling consoles of all time already. And they have the Zelda, um, the Zelda game coming out in a few, few, few weeks. I think, I think in May. So um, that's going to make, a, and they're probably going to promote that really heavily, and they're going to sell more consoles, maybe. But, but yeah, I think just having this IP, you know, it lets them, especially as like Disney monetizes all of its IP, you know, it kind of yeah. gives. Nintendo leeway to, you know, do much of the same. But um, but yeah, they're they're, they're totally different, I guess. You know, and they got this Nintendo World thing going with the you know, Universal Studios, which is interesting as well. Um, I think it's quite new in LA, but in Japan they've had it for like a year or two since COVID. But um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to watch. Yeah, I really want to go uh, go to this Nintendo park. Looks like a lot of fun from what I've seen and read about it. Um, there was a good write-up <clears throat> um, at the end of last year on Bloomberg, kind of showing what's in the California park. I remembered reading this story. I have it up on my screen now. It just, just looks like nostalgia embodied in reality. It looks like a lot of fun. There's a Mario Kart ride <laughs> i mean it just seems like they have the potential to really monetize property that they are sitting on uh in a way that very few can it doesn't you know take you much incremental capital to put out a product with mario on it and, and they've got they've got a lot of that from from their decades so really it's over a hundred year old business started with trading cards yeah, they've been very conservative with their with their growth strategy. Um, they don't just release stuff if they don't know if it's going to be really good. Um, usually, um, they, they they don't do like big cash grabs. But like recently, with like the App Store, they had that Mario Run game and a bunch of other ones, and those actually bring in quite a bit of money for them to have the you know microtransactions and stuff. And um, I guess people pay for that. You know, somebody does, but. Um, but it seems like they're getting a little bit more aggressive with the monetization of their assets, which is good. Yeah. There's a new, there's another park opening down interstate four from me and at universal Orlando resort in 2025. So if I don't get out to California or to Japan by then, I'll have to check it out when it's down the street from me. <laughs> but okay. Um, we talked about really everything on the prepared remarks is 502. Um, Chris, I always appreciate you chiming in, but if anyone in the audience had any questions or kind of wanted to take this anywhere else, you know, before we wrap things up, happy to do that. So I'll pause, see if anybody wants to raise their hand and come up. Otherwise, yeah, I think we can shut this down a little early and let folks enjoy their, their weekend. play some mario kart tonight now that we've had this conversation um all right good well it's it's friday the 7th 
Good Friday for those who, uh, I guess there's a lot, depending on what religion you follow, uh, of the big three, or, well, not big three, what am I saying, of, of a few of the major world religions um, going on. So maybe people are, are doing their religious uh, good, staying off technology, whatever it is. But thanks for those of you who did tune in to our 27th Wook and Review broadcast. Um, we will be back next Wednesday and Friday. Wednesday night at 7 Eastern on my personal handle to cover our um, just kind of weekly open mic talks. And then we'll be back next Friday at 4 at the close for our weekly Wook and Review. So um, hope everyone is stay safe, has a nice weekend. And uh, again, if you're interested, please be sure to give Wook Capital a follow. And you can check out either the Wook Capital Discord server or feel free to tune in to the GME DD Discord server. And we'd be happy to keep the conversation going with you uh, there or on Twitter for as long as Elon lets us. <laughs> but hope everyone has a great weekend. Uh, cheers, everyone. <laughs>